and welcome to Booklist. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today at Folio via Zoom in downtown Seattle is Julie Schumacher. Her new book is called The English Experience and it concludes a wonderful, wonderful trilogy that I wish would go on for more books. Julie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. So, um, so where did the idea for this trilogy begin? Well, it never started as a trilogy. Right, right. <laughs> I don't yes. know how other people who come up with series begin. Maybe Sue Grafton with her alphabet right. had that um, planned out beforehand. But it was just a one and done, dear mm -hmm. committee members. I was going to be finished with Jason Fitker but he wormed his way into my brain. So I continued with him in the second book, again, thought I was finished. And then I started um, leading trips abroad with undergraduates. Oh, really? And every time I got, I got to Madrid, where I brought the students, I couldn't help thinking, what would Jason Fitker, <laughs> my character, make of this? It just, he was all over my, all over my head. So it's a series of books um, that feature a, a English professor at a Midwestern university called Payne, P-A-Y-N-E, Payne U, um, which I have to say, when I, when I was reading it, I didn't get that joke right away until <laughs> it took me a while to get to that, to, to get that joke. But Dear Committee Members is set in, um, in, in it's an academic comedy and it is it's composed of letters emails different ways of communication between Jason Fitger your 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 hero and um, other the people that he's corresponding with so was that the way that you initially I mean, we're, we're, I, so here's what I thought. I thought there was just one day you teach at the University of Minnesota right and yes. And I just thought there was, <clears throat> excuse me, one day that you were just deluged with emails, you know, from department head and students and everybody. And, and it just came to you that it would be fun to do this. Well, it started in part as an experiment with form. You know, I was, I was challenging myself, would it be possible to write a novel in the form of letters of reference? Because... I had always admired essays and short stories that had particular forms. And I was frustrated with the number of letters of recommendation that one needs to write and receive and send in higher ed. You know, it's a constant um, environment of evaluating and being evaluated. And I kept asking myself, how many of these are actually being read? All these letters that were constantly scribbling and emailing to each other. So I thought, well, I'll create this form and this character who is in some ways raging against the confines of that form. What can you actually do within the confines of a dear sir, I heartily recommend so-and-so for this position? I thought it would be great fun to break the form wide open and have someone just <laughs> violate all traditional bounds of, of the protocol. And was it always, was Jason Fitger always, did he just come to you whole? He really did. He really did. He came from that form. I thought what sort of person would, in, for example, a letter of reference for a student, talk about his sex life or his divorce or you know, being sure that someone will probably not read his letter, he would feel free to talk about anything. And I thought, well, it has to be a, a massive egotist, you know, a person who is wildly inappropriate, <laughs> just <laughs> insistent on raging against the confines of the system in which he finds himself. So he he came just, he sprang almost entirely from that letter of recommendation, yeah. restrictive form. Was there, were there things, because you didn't plan it as a trilogy, or you hadn't planned at the beginning that there would ever be other books about Jason Fitger, were there decisions that you made in that first novel that um, made it harder uh, in, in the subsequent novels that you had to deal with? I'm always interested in that kind of... Yeah. That's an interesting question, because... Um... 
Yeah, when writing the second and the third, I had to constantly go back. Yeah. I developed a lot of respect for people who do write series of books because I thought, what did this character look like? What did I say? Is this person old or young? You know, did they teach this discipline or that discipline? I, I couldn't remember. You know, often somebody will ask me about a passage or a character in an earlier novel, and I think, I have no idea anymore. Right. why I made that decision or why I wrote that paragraph or included that in a book. So it, it did take, it felt like I was researching my own work in a weird way. <laughs> um, but I do like to have, and this was the genesis for the first book, that that form, I do like to have some sort of confinement or restriction in um, in, a, in a writing project. Because if if you just have to face the wide open white page day after day, it's yeah. a terror. There are too many choices. I feel like part of the object in, in writing a first draft is to limit your choices, just to confine yourself to something. Sort of like what Robert Frost said about um, free verse, that it was like playing tennis without a net, you, yeah. you know, yeah, th exactly. that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. There's a great phrase in um, a Katsia novel, the Waiting for the Barbarians, where um, the main character, the magistrate, talks about the liberation of confinement. It's a very different context, right. but I think about that. You know, there's a freedom in, in having a restriction right. as a writer. You just feel more secure, and it gives you a momentum. Mm -hmm. And and how much of how much of Jason Fitker is? It, 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 well, so much of it Excuse must me. come from yes, yes. So much of it must come from your experience. I know. I know that one of the editors I worked with um, was talking to another at Doubleday who asked him, "Is she really a scary person? You know, what is this woman like?" And he said, "No, actually, she's she's a nice person." That's what he said. He said. Um, and I feel like there's so many things I would never say, or do or you know voice but I could give all those things right Jason Ficker and it was wonderfully cathartic yeah to just <laughs> you know you're in the middle of a conversation and you think oh man I could come back with something but you don't because you're right. talking to another nice person and you want to be civil etc but <laughs> Ficker wouldn't wouldn't have to do that he wouldn't need to play by those those rules so I I loved um playing with him often he regrets the things that he says yeah but it takes him a while I always wanted to do a second Twitter um handle like bad Nancy just say oh, where I could say oh, everything yeah. bad yeah. Nancy I'd subscribe yeah, right. <laughs> and so the first book won the Thurber Prize for humor which which I thought was just absolutely wonderful because there aren't that many humorous novels that um, that are clever and fun and interesting, I think, which which dear committee members absolutely was. Um, but Jason Fitger, when I was thinking about him, he's not an anti-hero. I mean, he is the hero and and he you very cleverly in all the books shown his humanity. Um, and and you know his regret for the some of the things he says, and for um, and just just shown him to be a caring person, especially toward his students, and at a certain level his ex-wife. Oh, I never wanted him to be one hundred percent jerk. Right. He is often a jerk. Yeah. Um, you know he's he's, he's no diplomatic qualities he's just you know he's voicey and absurd often but i do want the reader to care about him i feel like it's always more interesting to deal with characters who are flawed you know right. who wants to deal with a saintly character all the time there's nothing to say about a saintly character they just right do it so i i really like the idea of fitker's virtues shining through the cla and the cracks and all those flaws that he has, which are numerous, but he cares deeply about the things that I care about, you know, uh, the arts, <laughs> humanities, which are as ever under siege. 
yeah. um, you know, <laughs> especially arts and education, not just higher ed, but K through 12, they're always the first things to, to be cut. And he rages against that. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I, I don't think of him as an anti-hero as much as a very, very flawed hero. <laughs> yeah. And somebody I think that so many of us could identify with because, you know, who, no matter who we are, we do say stupid things sometimes. I mean, things... And Jason just happens to say perhaps more of them um, than others. But then in the second book, The Shakespeare Requirement, um, you know, I think even more, he comes into his own, you know, as, as somebody who, 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 as you said, cares about the things that many of us care about, the arts and education and, you know, the whole overtaking of the college experience as as a job development rather than growing as a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think in each of the books, it is the students that yes. most allow him or cause him to change, to yeah. develop as a human being. You know, he's he's very bristly. His ex-wife at the beginning of the English experience says to him, you don't even like students. You know, right. you are the worst person to be leading a trip abroad, which is is true. He's not nurturing, she points out. Um, and he's never been together with students 24-7. He's used right. to teaching, you know, an hour and then the students leave, etc. It's a shock to his system to be with them all the time. But it does cause him to understand things that he might not have understood otherwise to, yeah, to change. Not radically. He never radically changes. He's still no. here. Right. But, but he, he does, you know, he does learn. Yes. Learn. Yeah. And he, and, you know, to give him credit, he, he didn't want to be the person to escort those 11 kids to England. He recognized how, how, you know, how inadequate he would be um, in that position. And he hates England. England is a country he really <laughs> does not care for. He complains yeah. about the weather. He complains about the food. Right. He really doesn't want to go, but he is basically strong-armed into going. Right. Uh, yes. Who to threatens him financially, threatens yes. his department. Right. Right. Because by then he's the head of the English department, which, which was, which occurred in, um, in the second book, The Shakespeare Requirement. Um, did you enjoy writing these? I loved, I loved, I loved it. I mean, dear committee members in particular, because I started it thinking this is just a silly experiment and low stakes. I'll probably throw it out. It's just something I'm writing to amuse myself. Um, I didn't really think about it as a book. It was just uh -huh. a bunch of silly things I was scrolling in, in, a, in a notebook. But after I had a number of the letters, I kept thinking there must be a way to really glue this thing together to yeah. make it stand as a as a novel. I had reread a bunch of times that um, 84 Charing Cross Road mm -hmm. by Helene Hanf, and I loved the way that that fit together, even though it was just a correspondence. Um, right. I always admired the way that that fit together. And I, I read it over and over, figuring I, I got to be able to do this. So you teach creative writing at, at, yes. at the University of Minnesota. I, I've often thought that if you go into a writing project thinking about n not doing it for yourself, I guess, I guess I'll put that positively, that it seems to me the way to write a novel is to write it for yourself. Just what you just what you did, because because I think if you start thinking about, oh, maybe this will be published or will my agent like it or, you know, you know, can she he or she sell it? Um, I, I mean, then that that kind of hamstrings you. Um, and but if you're doing it for yourself, then you can be as sort of wild as you want. Yeah, I think so. It sounds egotistical, but you often hear writers say, well, I wrote it, I was my first audience, you know, and then right. I gave it to my spouse or to my right. writer friend, you know, then I'm I'm writing it for two people and then three people. And only then when you feel like it's successful to that small group of one or two or five, yeah, then you send it out. The few times that I've 
you know, written to um, an assignment or to someone else's specifications. I've not enjoyed the process at all. Originally, you know, graduating from college, I thought, oh, I'll be a journalist because I, I like to write. And I just couldn't do it. I, I didn't like writing what somebody else told me to write. It has to be this long. It needs to be um, about X, Y, and Z. Right. I No, I'm more of a daydreamer. In the English experience, one, <laughs> one of the reasons, this is just, I mean, I have to say I chuckled throughout this whole thing. I just couldn't wait till it was published because I so wanted to interview you to talk about it and just, you know, to sort of laugh together because um, right at the beginning um, when Jason is kind of has his arm twisted to to um, be the leader of of this group of 11 student undergraduate students he hates the whole idea because there's a colon you know a kind of misplaced colon he thinks misplaced and he's just um, and then it, and then he and his wife had a terrible trip to, to England, as you as you um, alluded to. So the whole thing um, gets off to a very bad start. And then, um, but it's the kids in all of your books, I think, who, who humanize the book and humanize Jason. Um, I, and I, 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 I thought, I mean, especially, the kids in the English experience. So one of the things that I most got a kick out of was the student who's never there, DB, <laughs> um, who, who, when everybody else is, you know, going to Stonehenge and Bath, DB is yeah, he's in sending texts from right, Prague, or right, from Paris. And right, see you soon. Right, Victor almost never sees him. He sees him yeah. on the way over on the plane, but then the, the guy just disappears. Right. Yeah. And and I mean, I think you just captured the the students so remarkably well in their writing because we read their essays and 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 sort of like Jason and his writing the students are supposed to write um, a, a, like a daily a daily essay uh, 500 words I think it it is um, ex, uh, about their the experience that they had during the day and and yet even in those essays supposedly with a topic sentence and it's about this you learn so much about the students the students write about themselves yeah I feel like it, it's I wanted it to feel a bit like a bookend to dear committee members because in dear committee members figures writing about himself in letters he's supposed to be writing about other right. people and in the English experience the students are supposed to be writing about, for example, what did I see in the British Museum that was of interest? Right. And they're right. writing about their love lives and the fact that they don't like the other person on the trip that they're rooming with or, right. you know, their anger <laughs> about various issues. They overshare. Yes, he overshared. Yes, in exactly. In the first of the three. And, I mean, that to me is so interesting about writing is there's a rule. You're given a rule, write 500 words about X. But it's always more interesting to break the rule, yeah. although not correct if one is going to be <laughs> turning in a paper in a class. Um, but I had great fun having the students violate everything the way that Ficker had violated everything. Yeah, I, earlier on. and it just it, it, it does make a, a lovely bookend um, to dear committee members. And and I mean, I, I, I think Jason Fitger ends up caring about the students as much as he can care about the students um, as he's able to but you as the you as the reader really care about the about the students and you always put these little kickers in which um, which I just appreciated um, you know there's a couple on the trip I'm not going to give anything away but there's a couple on the trip who have been like together since the seventh grade and he betrayed her and and then you hear about them in the epilogue about what happens to them. And it was just so, oh, Julie, I just thought you did such a great job. I mean, I feel like you just wrote it for me and anybody else who's looking. I did write it for you. I wrote yeah. it for you. <laughs> okay. yeah, I had great fun with that epilogue because 
you know, traditionally you get to the end of a book and I feel like at the end of a good novel, a reader often thinks, oh, I wish I knew what happened to those people. And I wanted to give a bit of a hint as to what happened to those students because he sees them for three weeks right. and then they're gone. That's the nature of teaching. You see a person during one small sliver of their life and then often never again. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. They go. What I wanted to give the reader a little bit of information about them. Um, there's a there's a wonderful um, dog in in the book. Um, <laughs> So I, who named Rogaine, which is a great, a great, a great name for a dog. Did you do you have a dog? I do, but um, I I got him as I was already writing the book. Oh, and, okay. um, yeah, the dog was in the Shakespeare requirement. Also, I had to. That was something I had to look back on. I thought originally I was going to set this new novel at a more contemporary time. And then I thought, oh no, the dog would probably be dead. I need to make it be earlier. So um, yes, Rogaine has a hair growth problem. So that's the yeah. reason for his name. And he's shared between Fitger and his ex-wife. Right, right. Which which they have a little issue with in, in, in this book. You also write, um, uh, or you've written for teens for young adults what is it how how would you decide and how would you decide whether a book that you're writing or an idea that you have is aimed at that audience versus an adult audience yeah that's 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 a tricky issue um yeah tricky especially now yeah well the first book i wrote for younger readers i did think um it was going to be a young adult novel and then i was told by the editor this is a middle grade book oh, which i hadn't i hadn't even heard the term at the time right. i just thought it's a book um and everything i wrote the editor would simply decide this mm -hmm. is young adult this is middle grade etc cetera, etc cetera. i did have in-house readership my kids were young when I was writing those books. And once they aged out of the market, I thought, wow, I don't have my in-house readers. Yeah. Also, I thought, you know, kids live a very technologically um, obsessed life now. And right. I am not a technologically savvy person. I thought I would just have to write historical fiction if I could do that <laughs> for kids, because I don't really, I don't know what their lives consist of anymore. Yeah. tweeting and being on TikTok. I just don't, I don't know what that is and how it feels. So it yeah. wouldn't be something I could do anymore. So, oh, so you don't, you, you don't think that we could. Rule it out. I love writing for younger readers because the emails that you get from a 10 year old are so much lovelier often than the ones that you get from adults. Because, um, you know, I have one that somebody sent me years ago who said, you know, I want you to write another book with this character because she is me. I think you know who I am. This is me. Will you please write another? You know, I just, I love yeah. that. Um, yeah. You know, it's what you want I mean, from a book. And a book can make yeah. such a massive impression if it finds a young reader who, you know, yeah. just clicks with it. What a lovely thing to get, you know, that email. Yeah, it was, it was terrific. Yeah. I also have had students write to me and say, my teacher made me read this book. It was okay. <laughs> and frankness, okay. I appreciate that. Do you do you read a lot of academic, like David Lodge, when I think about academic um, fiction, when I was thinking about placing your book in a context, um, you know, I thought about um, uh, David Lodge especially. Uh, yeah, I had read um, David Lodge, Richard Russo, Alison right. Lurie, um, right. Lockoff. But once I started with Jason Fitker, I didn't look at yeah. any of them. I thought, right. no, no, I have to stay away because it will infiltrate my brain. And I just want Fitker to be Fitker. Did you, so you recorded for the audiobook The Shakespeare Requirement. And the English Experience. And the English Experience. Yeah, I wasn't sure about that because it, it wasn't out yet when I yeah. so did you enjoy that I did although um this new one the English experience was much more challenging because there are so many different voices the undergraduate right. students turn in these pieces of writing and as I was recording the 
audio engineer kept saying to me, can you give it a little more, you know, more expression? Can you differentiate these voices? And I thought, I never even acted in high school. I am not an actor. Um, so at one point he asked me to do a British accent. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> I know what a British accent sounds like, but I don't know that I can do it. Um, yeah. He was coaching me, you know, just two right. lines with a British accent. Um, I, he would do a repeat after me, but it was I, kind of hilarious. I once read of, um, uh, uh, an, um, did an audio recording for a 500 word picture book and the publisher was there. Yeah. And and she would be the one. I mean, five hundred words, and and she would say, "Can you put a little more oomph in it?" And I, you know, and I had the same response. Like, if you want somebody to do that, get an actor. You know, I'm just this reader. They had originally sent me um, via email the voices of several uh -huh. actors reading the beginning of the novel and asking me which right. one would you choose. And these are professional people. They're terrific. It's possible they would have done a better job than I, but every time I listened to them, I just thought, no, the sentence shouldn't fall that way. It should fall this way. Right. You know, yep. I've repeated everything that I've written down so many times that it has a certain rhythm and a cadence, and I just couldn't hear it any other way. Yeah, that's how I felt. I got to record my novel, um, George and Lizzie, and, and yeah. I, I couldn't imagine anybody else doing it because it was always me telling the story. Yeah, you hear it. You hear it in your head. Uh, exactly. You know. exactly. Julie, our time is up. I'm just so, um, I'm so happy we got to do this. And I just cannot tell you, I just think these, these, these three novels capped by the English experience are just perfect reading for the world today. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I love talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye.